phone that has the Bible on it. I'm going to invite you one more time to find 1 John on there. It's right near the end of the Bible. If you're looking through the scrolling through the books of the Bible, you're going to find it right near the end, just before you get to Revelation. And we are going to wrap up this series that's called Realize. Okay, that's two words, Real Eyes, okay? Um, but the word realize is also, also a big piece of that as well. So go ahead and find First John while we just do a quick review here of what we talked about to this point. Part of the reason that we use this, uh, this word realize is because of the key verse in this series, which we'll look at tonight. We've been saying it every week. It's from First John 5 and verse 13, and it says, these things, I, I write these things to you, believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And that word know uh, isn't like exactly the way we use it in our modern day language. It is actually more like the word realize, like the light bulb moment kind of comes on. Oh, and now I see what you're saying because you can hear things many times and maybe it's all of a sudden it sinks in and you realize what's being said. And John wants us to realize that we have eternal life. That's where he starts in that verse, and that's kind of like the key for the whole deal, okay? He wants you to get that, have that epiphany in that moment where you suddenly realize, dude, it's not just, you know, I know all you are invincible now because you're somewhere between the age of 14 and 18 or 19, but when you get old my, like me, you start to realize, you know, your years are kind of like ticking. And so it, you, you suddenly realize that, oh, this is not the end whenever that day comes. There's actually, this is just a warm-up. This is just the, the kindergarten. This is like the, the beginning of the first lap of the race of eternity, which will stretch on forever and a day. And when you really realize that, again, it changes your perspective. I, let me ask you, have you ever really, I mean, do you really ever think about heaven? I mean, beyond just like you know heaven and you think of like angels on harp, playing harps and stuff like that, which really isn't realistic. But um, do, you ever, do you ever really anticipate what it's going to be like to go to heaven if you're a child of God. It's going to be freaking amazing. It's going to be unbelievable. And it's, it's just something that we don't really spend enough time really thinking about because we're so caught up in everything that's going on in our lives that the eternal kind of loses focus and loses its allure. And we don't even look forward to heaven as much as we do to our next big trip or our birthday or an event that's coming on up our lives. And this is for like all of eternity. So I just I'd take an extra second to talk about that because that's what John's talking about here when he says when you actually realize that you have eternal life. If you've given your life to Jesus, then you realize that that's real and that you actually are going to live forever with Christ and with, you know, a bunch of brothers and sisters around you as well, which is very cool. So he just wants us to be constantly circulating in our minds, you know, and that starts when you follow Jesus. So we talked about different stuff. We talked about how some people walk in the light, some people walk in the darkness. We all have a little bit of the light and the dark in, in us. And 1 John 1, 9 is a very famous verse. It says, if we confess our sins, he is, anybody know? Faithful, okay, and just to forgive us our sins. That was a really enthusiastic response. He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness because there are going to be times we wander and we're in the dark and we need that. We need to come back to that. We need to know that truth uh, in, in, in our lives for sure. And then the second week we talked about how um, Jesus is like a picture of the courtroom. We watched that crazy lawyer from Texas, you know, a commercial and all that. We talked about how Jesus is our advocate. He's like, you know, our lawyer. And he's also, beyond that, paid the entire debt that the court says that we owe. And then we talked last time, last week, about how we should love one another, which is about as generic as you can sound when you talk about Bible stuff. Of course, you're supposed to love one another. Anybody who just doesn't even show up at church knows that the Bible says so you're supposed to love people, but it defines love more specifically to say love is like lay, being willing to lay down your life for a friend, being willing to lay down your life for your brother and sister, and not just the people you really like, but whoever, whoever God puts in your path. That's love in action and not just love lip service and saying that you love somebody. So anyway, so that's where we've gone, and we're going to wrap up tonight, and we'll talk in groups in just a few minutes about this too. But we're going to go back to this imaginary courtroom that, uh, that John painted this picture back in chapter 2 about here in ch chapter 5. He goes back to it again, and we're going to pick up at verse 9. So 1 John chapter 5 and verse 9, if you've got um, your Bible up there, and if you don't, I think it's on the screens as well. So here we go. We're going to read uh, a few verses here tonight. Track with me. It says, If we receive the testimony of men, 
the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that he was born, uh, that, he, that he, he has born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning his son. So it's a little bit redundant. We'll explain. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. How many in here have grown up in church, like most of your life? Okay? A lot of you. That's what I figured. Okay? If you've grown up in church, you sometimes see a word like this that they said like three times during those verses, and that particular word I'm talking about now is testimony. Okay? And you see that word testimony, and you immediately, that's a churchy word, okay? And so in your Christianese mind that you have there, you automatically think, okay, I know what that means. Testimony means that's like my story of how uh, I found Jesus, or miraculously how Jesus found me, you know, uh, and that sort of thing. And so you're like, okay, I get that. I know what that, but just like that word know and realize we talk about, that's not really what John's talking about in this particular passage. It's not more accurate translation. John doesn't mean it in that way, when John mentions testimony here, he's talking about the legal record of the court. Again, we're like in this courtroom, kind of imagine this courtroom in your mind, okay? And this is like when the movies, when the judge asks the court record to be read out loud. Have you ever seen movies like that? They say, repeat back what the, the witness said, you know, and that sort of thing. Kind of like, how many of you guys like The Office? Anybody fans? Come on. All right, so kind of like this scene this short scene in the deposition episode of The Office. Mr. Scott, do you realize you just contradicted yourself? I did. Yes, you did. Can I go to the bathroom? No. I really have to. I've been drinking lots of water. You went five minutes ago. That wasn't to go to the bathroom. That was to get out of a question. You still have to answer it. First, can I go to the bathroom? No. The classic Michael Scott look there. Oh, my gosh, he cracks me up. So, yeah, so it packed a lot into just 30 seconds there that Michael had said. The clerk was reading back everything that he had said previous up into that point, uh, which was just astounding in that case. But anyway, so it's like, it's like that. In this case, though, it's the recorded testimony of God. Okay, so John's putting a lot of emphasis on this is what God says. He says it very clearly, people. You should listen. Okay, is what he's saying here, okay? And so let's review what he says just to make sure we got it. He says, God has given us eternal life. That life is in Jesus. If anyone has Jesus, he has life. If anyone does not have Jesus, he does not have life. Okay, pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty plain. Now, in, in our world, there's a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of talk about the exclusivity of Jesus. In other words, people... Sometimes even Christians, you know, just kind of duck away from saying that Jesus, you know, is the only way to get to heaven. They're a little nervous by saying that because it seems maybe harsh or, I don't know, even cruel maybe to some other people who believe something else. But according to John, again, the testimony on court record states very clearly that only through Jesus is there life. Let's go back to that statement again. He who has Jesus has life. He who does not have Jesus, what? Does not have life. It's very straightforward. Jesus, in fact, says it straightforward himself in the other book, the Gospel of John, that John was a part of. In John 14, 6, and a lot of you guys will know this verse, when Jesus, out of his own mouth, says, what, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, you know that part, but the second part's even more important. No one comes unto the Father except through me. No, and I, Where's the Father? He's in heaven. No one is getting to heaven except through me. So Jesus backs up everything that John's saying about him, you know, himself in the other Gospel of John, ironically. And this tends to frustrate some people. It can frustrate people, but at the end of the day, we have to admit that what the Bible teaches is very clear. There's no, you know, there's no duck in the issue whatsoever. Jesus is the only way to eternal life. And if that's true, think about it. Aren't you glad that someone would share that truth with you? If you really believe that that's true, that Jesus is the only way to heaven, then aren't you going to want to do everything in your power to let the people that you know around you, that you love, know that? Because if we started, if heaven is for real, is that the name of that movie? Heaven is for real? Yeah, I didn't even try that. If heaven is for real... And we're going to spend eternity so much longer than here, there, 
then wouldn't you want to make sure if Jesus is the only way to get there, that you tell people that? That you tell people that you know, even people that you don't like that much, that you still don't want to see die hopelessly, that this is the way to go. This is the way to eternal life. All right, let's move on here. Uh, There's just a lot of good verses in this chapter. Verse 13 of chapter 5, if you're tracking with me, all right? We'll read a few more verses here. It says, I write these things to you. This is a verse we started with, by the way, the key verse. We'll read it again. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Verse 16, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. Okay, we'll stop there. Last week we talked about loving each other, loving one another. And in the closing words of John's letter, he reminds us that a way to love someone is to pray for them. Okay, that's what he's saying here in this verse, you know, if it, uh, you know, ask God on behalf of your brother. You know, a, a, even a brother who's stumbling, a brother who's falling, or a sister who's, who's not, you know, not, not uh, on the right path. So question to us on that is some of our friends are making a series of bad mistakes in our life. We, you guys see it all around you. I see it with adults that are around me too. But you guys really see it where you're at. You see people crashing and burning all the time as far as decisions that they're making in life. So question is, are you praying for them? Have you ever prayed for them, whether it be your closest friend or an acquaintance or whoever? Because according to this, it says that that we know that we have the request that we've asked for if we ask according to his will. Well, according to God's will, he desires that all have eternal life. That's stated in the scripture too. He desires that everybody would spend eternity in heaven with him. So we know we can ask this according to his will that we're asking on behalf, God, would you get a hold of so-and-so's life? Would you speak to so-and-so? Would you use me to have an opportunity to talk to my friend about you? Because if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So take him up on that. Take him up on that and bring your hurts and bring your friend's hurts before God because his desire, again, is that all of us would come to know him. All right, and then John ends the letter here. We're wrapping up. With three no's, okay? And again, K-N-O-W, not no, okay? Uh, K-N-O-W, three no's in verse, uh, let's see, what is it? Verse, where are we at? 18? Yes, verse 18 and then 19 and then 20. So 18, he says, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. That's the first no, okay? In other words, saying we know that we're, we're born of God. We, because we're born of God, if we're born of God, we no longer have to sin. Yeah, the curse of sin is still on us because we live in a fallen world, but we're not, we're no longer a slave to sin. That song we sing, you know, I'm no longer a slave to sin, I'm a child of God. We don't have to sin anymore. We're no longer, we are free from the, cur- that, 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 the bondage to sin. Uh, and, and so in that, if you find in yourself a desire to stop sinning or just stop making bad choices, that's evidence that God is at work in your life. And then, of course, the contrary, too. If you don't have any desire to stop sinning, you might want to, you know, check your heart, as John Chris says, you know, and, and kind of see what's going on in there. The second no in verse 19 says, we know that we are from God, but the whole world lie, uh, lies in the power of the evil one. So we, are no, we know we're from God. The rest of the world is at odds with God. Uh, and and that's, that's incredibly hopeful to know that the brokenness of the world does not affect our stance, our position, you know, with God. Just because everyone else is like crashing and burning or making bad choices around you does not mean that you have to and that your relationship with God can be, you know, can be restored or can be maintained along the way. And then the final no of these three no's is the last couple verses in this letter, verse 20 and 21, says, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. He is the true God and eternal life. It's so funny. He, he starts with eternal life. He ends with eternal life. He really wants us to get that, you know, and, and get a, a grasp of eternity. And, and it, what is it, 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 4, where it talks about how our light and momentary trials are achieving for us an eternal glory that will far outweigh them all because 
we know that our minds are mostly fixed on temporary things, but instead we should be fixing our mind on eternal things. And we have to retrain our brain to begin to think that way and ask God to help us to begin to see things from an eternal perspective. So we know that Jesus has come to give us understanding, and we can know him. And get this, the more history that you build with, with him, with Jesus, you, you begin to not only trust what he says, but you also remember him and what he's done in your life. i just close with this idea. It's Christmas time, okay? Christmas is, as much as, as any holiday we celebrate, a holiday where we remember, uh, nostalgia uh, and traditions. You know, it's time for memories. You remember when you were a kid and the greatest Christmas present you got or did not get. You know, you remember going to grandma's house for Christmas Day, you know. You remember, uh, you know, just the, whatever certain traditions your family does. It's a time for, for remembering, and we build that history with our families and the people that we love and John's saying here that we can build that with Jesus. We can build a history with Jesus, kind of like we do with the people that we do at Christmas time here, because we can trust what he says, but we can also remember who he is and what he's done for us. That's why it's so important, I say all the time, to write stuff down when you're reading your Bible, when you're tracking with God, because we forget often, and we want to remember who God is and how faithful he is to us, and that if he's come through us, come through for us in the past, He'll do it again today, and he'll do it again tomorrow, and he'll do it in the future as well. And I think about that as, as we wrap up this time here tonight and, and just heading into Christmas and thinking about the, the, in all of history, we're talking about building history with the people we love at Christmas, building history in relationship with Jesus, and there is not one person really ultimately in history that has not been affected by one solitary life. And I just want to read this as we close, thinking, our, focusing our hearts towards the holiday, but also focusing our hearts towards what we've talked about here tonight. Bless you. And it says, here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman, grew up in another village, worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30 years old, and then for three years was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place that he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial, was nailed upon a cross between two thieves, while he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth, a coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. And yet 20 centuries have come and gone. Today, he is the centerpiece of the human race and leader of the column of progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. Let's pray together. As you have your head bowed and your eyes closed, and we just wrap up this series tonight, I, I just uh, think all of us have something that we can learn from what we've talked about here in First John. And I don't know whether you've been here for all these sessions or just here for the first time tonight, but I come away with at least three things that probably are very common to many of us, the things that we could really ask God to help us that we might have struggles with, issues with, that God, would you help me to take from your word and what's what we've talked about here and to be able to trust you to move forward in this, this area of my life. And the first one is just believing and really realizing that there is eternal life in Jesus. For some of us, that's, that's the first step. The second thing I come away with from this study is that if we ask of God that he will forgive us, that he will forgive us and we don't have to keep stumbling over the same mistakes every time. 
And the third truth, I think, is that we should love because we are loved. And when we do love others, it's evidence of God changing our hearts and our lives. If you're just honest tonight before me, as I just kind of close our time in prayer tonight in this series, which one of those do you most connect with of those three truths? How about this first one? Anybody in here would say, you know what, I, I have a new understanding, a realization of what, that, that actually eternal life is for real and that we can spend eternal life with Jesus if we're a child of God. If that's you, just head bow down, just raise your hand. You're like, yeah, that's, that's me. That's kind of what I'm learning from this here tonight. Yeah, I see that. Awesome. What about the second one? That if we ask God, he will forgive us. And we don't have to keep being tripped up over the same sin over and over again because we don't have to live under that bondage anymore because of what Jesus has done for us. Who's in that boat? Say, so, you know, that's, that's where I get hung up. Yes, I see those hands. I don't want to keep doing the same things over and over, same, stumbling over the same things. Appreciate that. And then the last one, we need to love others because we have first been loved by God. And when I love other people, it's evidence that God is changing me. Who say that? That's what I need to work on right there. Just lift your hand up. Awesome. Jesus, tonight, whatever it is, I'm so thankful that you know us intimately. You see our hearts. And when we're willing to just lay them bare before you, you are willing to to do the work necessary to change us. So I pray for those that tonight are just having a new realization of what eternal life really looks like. And maybe with that, that they need to change their life to start to live it with a purpose and let other people know the same thing. For those that are just hung up and feeling that they just really aren't forgiven, would you break through Spirit of God and let them know that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and you will forgive them and cleanse them and restore them to a right relationship with you. And finally, Lord, for those that are just struggling with really loving people the way that you've called us to, would you give them a heart of compassion, a heart of passion, a heart of empathy, a heart that sees people like you do. So God, tonight, teach us mold us, change us, do what you need to do. We're pliable, we're, we're flexible, we're, we're here like putty in your hands to, for you to shape us however you want. Help us to keep an open and willing spirit and heart to receive from you and to become more and more like you each and every day. We pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.